Well, if you've ever thought about defrosting frozen bread in the microwave, I would highly discourage it. I speak here from personal experience, of course. I arrived one Sunday morning to the early worship service of the church I previously served, only to discover that the bread we were to use for communion that day had not been taken out of the freezer the night before. And so, what do you do with frozen bread just a few minutes before worship begins? You put it in the microwave, of course. What I didn't know is that while that bread comes out deceptively soft at first, after only a few minutes, that same bread becomes hard as a rock again. You can imagine then by the time I got to the words of institution how tough it was to tear. This is my body. (laughs) You can also imagine then what it was like for those coming forward to receive communion by intinction that morning. Instead of simply tearing off a soft piece of bread and dipping it into the cup, folks found themselves engaged in a kind of -of tug-of-war match with myself and the other elder serving that day. While we did our best to rip off pieces of bread sizable enough to represent God's love, what folks ended up with was more like a mere morsel or a few crumbs. There was one woman, though, who came forward determined. She was toward the end of the line, so I suspect by the time she got to us, she had heard the rumors about the bread that had turned into a stone. I watched as she put her hand on the elder's hand, which held the bread, and then on the other hand itself on the bread, and she began to dig her fingers deeper and deeper into this loaf, pulling and grimacing and tugging as hard as she could until finally this half the bread comes off in her hand. Thinking she might, you know, tear a piece off or tear it in half and put it back on the plate, making it much easier to swallow, she smiled, shrugged, and crammed the whole thing in her mouth. (laughs) As she did so, I heard the elder serving with me whisper to her, be careful, don't choke. (laughs) Which, of course, immediately sent all three of us into the giggles like you this morning. And if you've ever gotten the giggles when you're not supposed to be giggling, well, you know you can't stop. I spent the rest of the service trying to collect myself. Don't get any ideas this morning. But while that elder's words, don't choke, were meant to be practical, I got to thinking this week about how they were also, well, theological. After all, when it comes to Jesus, most of what he does and says, it, it can be sort of hard to swallow. Or at least that would have been the case in our reading for today. While John tells us that Martha is preparing a meal based on what unfolds in this story, I suspect that no one is eating it. I mean, first you have Lazarus, raised from the dead three days prior, sitting at the kitchen table, the stench of death likely still present. Then there's Mary, taking down her hair and anointing Jesus' feet, none of which would have been appropriate for a first century woman with a man to whom she's not married, especially while others are watching. And finally, there's Jesus, standing in the middle of it all, receiving it without hesitation, as if this is all perfectly normal and acceptable. Not only would this scene have been hard to swallow in the first century, one commentator I read this week called it downright scandalous, even by today's standards. And yet none of this is as appalling as the point Judas of all people wants to make when he asks, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? You see, the real controversy of this story isn't in raising the dead or or crossing boundaries, but rather in, of all things, a bottle of perfume. After all, this isn't just any old scent you can go down and buy at the local department store. No, Judas says it's worth 300 denarii, which would have been equal to a year's worth of wages in the first century. 
And here Mary is, dumping it, the entire bottle, on Jesus' feet, while everyone watches her wipe it up with her hair. After all Jesus has said about money, about wealth, not to mention taking care of the poor and the widows and the orphans, Judas actually has a point. What on earth is Jesus doing standing there receiving this extravagant waste of a gift? Quite frankly, had I been sitting around that table that evening, I'm not sure I would have been eating either. I can remember several years ago, Marion and I being part of a, a wedding for a couple of Divinity School friends in downtown Indianapolis. Actually, I was to be the groom, for the, or the best man for the groom, <laughs> not the groom. I was to be <laughs> the best man for the groom, and Marion was to be the matron of honor for the bride. We arrived at the church early because Laura, the bride, wanted us to meet her pastor. And so we went by the church offices looking for Pastor Linda. However, when we arrived, she was nowhere to be found. And so Laura asked the church secretary, do you know where Pastor Linda is? The secretary replied, oh yeah, she's in jail again. Now, if that wasn't shocking enough, what she said next will stay with me forever. You know, that's just Pastor Linda. No, I didn't know. Your pastor's in jail. Come to find out, this was sort of a regular thing for Pastor Linda. This time it had been because she and several other clergy had been protesting outside the city courthouse, advocating for fair pay for the city's custodians. Other times it had been for similar causes. But no matter the circumstances, it was always to stick up for the least of these. Laura turned, looked at us, laughed, and said, she just can't help herself. Which is true if you think about it. That's the thing about loving God or loving one another. Sometimes you just can't help yourself. You can't help but cross boundaries. You can't help but go against best practices. You can't help but be wasteful or extravagant or whatever it is in that moment because you're so caught up in it all, you're not thinking. You're just, well, you're just loving despite yourself. And living like that, well, that's bound to put you into some pretty controversial circumstances. It's bound to take you places you wouldn't otherwise go. It's bound to make you sometimes do things that others might find hard to swallow. I mean, this is certainly was the case for Jesus, right? While we domesticate it today, the scandal of his entire life and ministry is what puts him on the cross. Born of a virgin in a cow stall? A Jewish carpenter from Nazareth of all places? Baptized by his crazy cousin John the Baptist? Seeing the devil in the wilderness? He eats with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. He tells people to give everything they own away and to follow him. He teaches them to love your, neighbor, love your enemy, turn the other cheek. He commands others to forgive 77 times and to go after the one sheep who's got away from the flock. While I'd like to believe we wouldn't execute him today, there's a pretty good chance he'd be in prison or at the very least, homeless on the street, completely ignored by the world. The point is that whoever or whatever our God is, the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ is certainly not a God interested in status quo, safety, security, or a whole hum approach to what happens in the world around us. No, this is a God it's hard to swallow. 
even more harder to follow. And yet, I do see it all the time. In the person who gives well beyond their means to the church because they say they simply love God. The person who literally sells everything they own and goes overseas to become a missionary. The person who dedicates every ounce of time and energy in retirement to lobbying politicians to advocate for the poor and those who can't advocate for themselves. Of course, I'm not suggesting it's always this extreme. In fact, most of the time, following Jesus happens in much smaller steps. But if you follow long enough, you inevitably find yourself in an uncomfortable conversation sticking up for people you don't even know. Or with people who are vastly different from you, who might even crawl all over your skin. And yes, even embroiled in controversy up to your ears in hot water, not knowing exactly how you got there. Look, I'm not suggesting that you should disregard all boundaries and never think before you act. We should always count the cost. It's just that sometimes your brother Lazarus has been given new life. Sometimes you yourself have been raised from the dead. Sometimes you're so overcome with gratitude and love that you just, you can't help yourself. You know, it's true what they say. We learn from our kids more than anyone else. It's certainly been the case for me. Which is the reason that one of the things I find most important about being a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is that we welcome everyone to the table, including our children. After all, you can learn a lot from how kids receive communion. They run forward and without hesitation grab a huge chunk of bread the size of your fist and deep it, dip it deep into the chalice, making sure to soak up every ounce of juice possible. I'll often watch uncomfortable parents try to intervene. Now, that's too big a piece, honey. You, you don't need to take that much. And I'll find myself thinking, no, that, that kid's got it about right. Right. 